Hey guys, Carrie Tallarico here with Sew and Grow Together. Just wanted to quickly um, give a little intro to this video. This is going to be an interview style video. James and I had done a video a little while back ago uh, sharing with how God opened our hearts to discipleship. We'll make sure and post a link to that video so you can see it. Um, and we told you that we were going to be doing a video about the discipleship that we went through with our sons. So that is what this video is today. They're older now, and it was kind of exciting for us as the parents to, to kind of get a little bit of feedback uh, and see what they really thought of the process and how it worked out and kind of share what we did with them with you. So I hope you enjoy today's video. It's a little lengthy, but it is well worth it to hear each of our boys as they go through what it was like being discipled by their dad. Anyhow, thanks, God bless. Oh, stay tuned to the end because there's also a part on there about discipling your daughters. Hello and welcome. We are three families who come together to help each other grow in our faith, family, homesteading, and whatever else life throws our way. Join us on this journey as we sow and grow together. Hello, my name is James Tallarico. And my name is Mason Tallarico. I am his oldest son. I am 21. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the discipleship that you guys have gone through. Uh, James, can you explain some of the things that you take the boys through in your discipleship with them? <clears throat> uh, yeah, um, I know uh, it's physical, mental, and spiritual uh, is the main categories as far as... Why was this important to do discipleship with your children as I matured in, in, in my walk and my faith, um, I really felt like um, I was ignorant in so many areas. I was weak in so many areas. And honestly, as I grew stronger in the Lord and in my faith, and I, the deeper I studied and read, the more uh, frustrated I remember being at a young age. And I wanted to make sure my children were, weren't there. Didn't walk through life with that same frustration. That's good. Okay. And what would you say to other men, other dads, and this is a struggle that you had, that feel that they are not qualified? Horse crap. <laughs> okay. Can, would you elaborate, please? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> God qualifies us in, in every aspect of, of life. Um, so I, I, I don't think any of us feel qualified. And, and there's numerous times when we were going through stuff that I'm like, God help me, especially some of the subjects we were hitting. I'm like, I don't know <laughs> if I'm there yet to guide somebody else when I'm still struggling with certain things. What would you say to other dads that are maybe on the fence about whether this is really a step that they should take with their children? Do you love your kids? Get off your butt. So this to you is an act of, of love, of guidance and important yeah. enough to push through the hard times. Mm -hmm. Mason, looking back, is this something that you will do with your children? Yeah, I, to varying degrees, but yeah, I'd like to do something similar for my own children. Okay. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think any, I would really necessarily want any of the boys to feel like this, our walk as Christians is not a cookie cutter thing. So I don't expect them to do everything exactly how I did it. Learn from the way I did it and say, you know, that was really maybe unnecessary for me, but maybe it'll be necessary for my kids and just kind of let God guide you. Playing you're going to know your kid better than anybody else. So when you're doing it, I think. What was the biggest thing that you liked going through the discipleship with your dad? The uh, triathlon was a very big one for me. Okay. What was the difference between your dad, like your dad before following, and like when he really included you in, the, in his journey? So I am the one who had a lot more memory of you guys before that point. It was just throughout it, it I didn't realize how much I felt like I lacked within everything within my own identity and within... A family in general within discipleship in general until he had started when he started discipling me I started not only learning a lot more understanding a lot more but uh, there was just a lot more of a shared heart within our relationship 
So shared heart, that's a really good spot to start. James, do you mind uh, elaborating what a shared heart is? Um, as parents, we like to say, do this, don't do that, but we never elaborate on why. Um, I think the shared heart is where I say, don't do this, do that, and this is why. And, and I've, I've screwed up in this area, so this is what happened to me when I messed up. So it's me sharing my heart to help you, uh, honestly, not just do what I'm told, do what you're told, but say, ooh, I see where you're saying that could, and I see what that has done to you, so I'm going to grasp hold of this, what you're saying, and I'm going to run with it. Mm -hmm. And why is the shared heart important? What do you think, Mason? Oh, for trust. I, I think that when you're younger, you need to be told no and nothing else, and yes and no, or nothing else. Like, just smack on the hand and move on. But I think as you get older... The more you do that, the more you'll push them away, or push them away. That was my own experience with it. The more you let them into your thought process, the more, from my own experience, the more I came to trust you guys. And, and honestly, that's where, um, where we started at that age, 13. Mm -hmm. Starting at that age, they're starting to, you know, they're not a man yet, but they're starting to uh, take on those traits as seeing themselves as pr pr protectors, providers, helpers. <laughs> So you guys, you know, you do need to hear that and see different sides of uh, what adult adulting is and then stepping into manhood from a child's perspective. So I, I agree with you where you said um, the yes and no, just do what you're told. When they're younger, there's a lot of safety thing. Mm -hmm. But as you get older, you do need to understand there's reasons why. And and as you get older, me sharing my heart with that, that, that helps you mm -hmm. understand better. I think um, I'll add a little disclaimer in here real quick. Um, during the time that you're talking about on the yes and no's, we call that practicing obedience um, because it's important for us to learn how to listen first time and to do it first time uh, when we're told because asking why could present a lot of dangers, taking that time and not being obedient first. However, we always give our kids a safe zone once they have listened mm -hmm. to come back and learn the why behind it yeah. if they don't understand something. Yeah. Okay, 13 is where you really jump in with the boys, jumped in with the boys on starting their program. So how, and I say program, it's not a written program, but it was, it was definitely an ordeal and a program that they went uh, through a I journey, wrote, yeah, I, I should say. I to organize it on paper. Yeah. Because there was so much to it in my mind that I didn't want to forget and leave parts out. Okay, so what's the first thing that you did with them? Um, there was a video on it, and it was about starting, starting this, starting to prepare your ch your your young men for manhood and going into this journey with them, uh, starting at that age and more or less running the rest of their life. I know some of the video that I observed was it was literally just from 13 up to 18 or 13 up to 19, but I I don't agree with that. I think it's a we disciple each other. I disciple him, pulling him. him as he grows up beside me, and we just were there for each other. Lean on each after, other. Yeah, as, as he you know, matures, he's a dad too. He's a husband too, you know, in that sense. So. Hopefully soon. What was your question again? <laughs> <laughs> what was the first thing that you did with oh, them? You know, there was a contract. It may seem very formal. The way the video put it, and I, and I presented to him this way, and I, and I didn't know if maybe... Uh, I worried a little bit it was too too formal, but... I took him out to a place that we all enjoyed camping, and it was just him and I, and it was cold. <laughs> it was it's freezing. Cold. Anyway, day. <laughs> we got a fire going, and, and I just let him know that we're going out there for something important. wasn't anything bad, uh, and just the getting away from everybody, just him and I, we, he, you know, he loved that anyways. We loved it, and uh, we got a fire going, and I sat down and explained to him why we went out there, and, and, and it was a contract, and I read through it. It explained why I was doing it, what, what I was doing, the different phases, so to speak, of it, and then asked him if he would be interested in that. Okay, so why a contract? I think it gives them something tangible to see later mm -hmm. on in life. Get some, they can, he, he can go back you know, to his house and, and read the contract and remember everything that we did and go through it and remember why. And I think that it wasn't so much of a, I'm tying your hands, you have to do this. <laughs> It wasn't anything like that. I think it was just something to give them something tangible. And, uh, yeah. What did you think on. about it whenever Dad presented that to you? 
I didn't personally think it was too formal. I thought it was really cool. It, it laid down all the groundwork on what we would be doing, and uh, I really, I, I thought it was cool. I didn't think too deeply into it until we started progressing into the actual, like, process of becoming a man. It was just really cool. What was some of the things laid out in it? I really, I really tried to stop because I know when uh, I started uh, digging into the Word, when I was struggling on my identity to find out what God expected a man, you know, how He defined a man and what He expected a man to be, I seen a lot of things about a part of, of um, you know, controlling emo controlling your emotions, you know, kindness, goodness, you know, there's a lot of you know, so if, if I'm going to find out what a man is, I should go to the Creator who made men. So going in there to find out what, what he expected, that's where I kind of went in that area and tried to really fo uh, focus on three categories, but each one of them kind of spread out, branched out into a little bit different areas. Um, I think our first one was uh, spiritual, where we started in a book called Checkpoint, a tactical guide to manhood. Uh, it is by Brian Mills and Nathan Wagner. So why uh, that book? Why this book? Um, we were um, going online and we knew what we wanted to do, but I wanted something that would uh, really hit a lot of topics that teenagers were dealing with uh, and things that I didn't have any guidance going through on my own. So I came across this, you know, uh, being in the military, it hit dead on. Um, checkpoints, a tactical guide to manhood. It, from what I understand, read, remember reading in the back, it was a gentleman who was a, a youth pastor, and then his best friend, or a good friend of his, he uh, was in the service. He was overseas, and when they came back, they formulated this idea of making this book, and the checkpoints, you know, it's, it's a, a military setup through the book as far as how to handle different situations. When you're going from A to B, C, uh, how to plan out and having uh, protection in certain areas, having reinforcement and, and planning on how, how you go through life, vulnerabilities in life, things like that. Can you uh, list off maybe a couple of the chapter titles just so we can have an idea? <clears throat> uh, checkpoint one is identity and uh, that's the chapter and then there's several subjects through it like pride, performance-based acceptance, failure, resentment, and so forth. Checkpoint two is integrity and it has several areas there dealing with lying and cheating and so forth. Uh, checkpoint three is community. Checkpoint four is self-control. Um, What's your it was, review? <laughs> it was very helpful. The way my dad has always given examples or tied things to where it helps him understand it is usually military-based or actions that way. So it was very. It felt very much like a layout that I could understand because most of his analogies were military-based. So. So what actually in the book is laid out like bil militant? What do you mean by that? Um, it uh, covers things, checkpoints for one, the chapters, uh, hazards, dealing with things in life, um, force multipliers, uh, after action reviews, AARs. Uh, each of those is uh, the one gentleman who was a soldier, how he covered things and how he could explain things. And, and from a, I don't know, boys are adventurous, you know. Mm -hmm. This is kind of a militant way to do it without, all, you know, a whole lot of the military discipline. Okay, so hazards is things to watch out for. Yes. St like stumbling blocks. Yes. So someone without a military background, would they be able to understand how to use this book? Yes, it actually went through, uh, when I was reading it to them, it explains how to use this book. It has a section on that. And it explains, you know, what a checkpoint is, what a hazard is, what a force, force multiplier is, and so forth. So, Can non-military men follow this book? Oh, absolutely. It covers a lot of that with the description on how to use this book. There's a section in it at the beginning. Um, for example, uh, you know, different. it describes each thing, but for example, we uh, talked earlier about force multipliers. A force multiplier to service members is you're going to through a vulnerable area, and to give force multipliers, you may have snipers covering in that vulnerable area. You may have other uh, supporting units covering you in so this like other support. area. Support in those areas. And the similar view is if he's going into a vulnerable uh, day or a vulnerable stage in his life, he needs support, whether that's me, one of his brothers, or another, you know, somebody else helped him disciple him. 
that gives him that support. How did you guys take on this book? Like, Mason, did you read it on your own? What did you do? How did you guys cover this? We met up, or we met up every time to read it. Sometimes he'd let me read it, but I mean, I, I didn't read this one on my own. I We read it together. Mm. Yeah, this is more of the spiritual section of, of the reading. Uh, the Intellectual, on the other hand, was uh, another book called Seven Men that I would have him read on, on his own while I was at work and whatnot. And when, when I would come home sometime through the week, we would discuss what he was reading, some of the things he liked, disliked about the, the book. And Now, you didn't just go through the Checkpoint Guide to Manhood for Your Spiritual. So that wasn't the only book that you went through. What was, uh, what was another book that you guys said for Spiritual? Um, uh, the Resolution for Men. It was, uh, it's based off of a film called Courageous. It was, uh, yeah, I think, at least for me, I don't know, I know it had a large effect, the film had a large effect on you, oh, but, yeah. um, that's what I mostly associate with a lot of, like, the way we went about things with the contract and promising each other to, like, build each other up to support each other. And you guys actually called and made a name for that. Oh, uh, when we would talk about, um. When we were going through discipleship, anytime you, uh, you know, when you guys were struggling or something on anything, I wanted you guys, oh. we called it our safety net. Safety net, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you guys, you knew that you were safe to come to me, what, no matter what your struggles were or how you had fallen or how you had failed or whatever. And I wanted you guys to know that. And as you guys got older, I started looking to you guys as a safety net as well. Mm -hmm. How did you do, like, Bible studies, anything like that? Most of our Bible studies during that period in time anyway was, like, heavily based around the topics that we were going through within the checkpoints and the resolution for men. I think, didn't we have, um, didn't we have Bible studies as a family, as a household? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, we these were were, and then these were separate Bible studies. So yeah. I think yeah. we, were, we spent a lot of time yeah, together in that. What are some other things that you did on the spiritual side? Things that I, I struggled with was I didn't know how to read the Bible growing up. So that was, uh, that was a point I wanted to make sure they could read it. Because I, I always told you guys, and I still tell you guys, don't take my word for it. I could be misremembering. I'm I, unintentionally teaching you wrong. Get in there and study it. So that was one question they had was how how do I study the Bible? So I taught them how to use a concordance and making sure, you know, not taking things out of context. And, and so many people focus on, you know, not taking some out of context. But if you don't go to the concordance and understand what the actual meaning of each word, it doesn't matter if it's in context or not. The definition has to come before the contact so little things like that they he that way he can hit a subject or you know mm -hmm. it made a lot more of our bible studies a little more personal and more easy to understand what was the physical for the physical a lot of it was um it was setting up a helping me set up a schedule for like not just working out but also when to eat when to get my school work done and like mm -hmm. working within that and time that was, management yeah time management and it was just it, it helped me throughout that but through the or the rest of it was more like eating healthy and uh workouts what was the workouts preparing for the <laughs> workouts were preparing for the triathlon which was like i said before the one of the more memorable kind parts of, of it graduation kind <laughs> yeah. of thing you know going a manhood you know training for the triathlon it was uh the more memorable part uh as dad has called it throughout different points, he called it the graduation. And it was, uh, it was very personal. I will always remember that. And, uh, I know we did not train nearly enough for that kayak portion. <laughs> we had, um... So explain the triathlon. Yeah, how, um, how, what was it? We had three portions. It was, uh, there was... Hiking? Yeah, yeah it was there's... hiking, biking. Hiking, biking, and kayaking. Mm -hmm. And I really tried to equate a lot of it to life. There's going to be times in life where you, you're hiking. And it's, there's nothing complicated and it's simple and, and you can actually smell the roses. You know, we stopped and looked a lot of things along the way and looked at different animals and just enjoyed. Pretty sights. Yeah, there was. There was a, yeah. So it gave me time to talk about those times of life and then biking. Different times it was safety issues, you know, with traffic and safety issues there. Sometimes you... There was no griping. You couldn't breathe. You just gutted it and went. And there was no time to talk, and there was no ability to talk. You just sort of kept together and <clears throat> yeah. supported each other. That was very... When it came to the triathlon, it was... Uh, 
there were three aspects building up to it the like you said the spiritual the intellectual and the physical and the physical was always kind of pushed uh, onto its own it was its own category because a lot of times intellectual and spiritual would be hit almost within the same sub or same mm. moment but uh the triathlon the graduation day was very much uh a mixing point of all three like very much tied in a lot of that that was a lot of our hiking portion was him talking about how life isn't uh, you get to this point and you're finished. It's uh, you trek through every day, every good day, every bad day. Yeah. You trek through, try to get to the end of it, and you keep going. You know, the triathlon, it, it reflected uh, life and the different phases that we, that we have growing older, uh, different uh, phases spiritually as we're growing older as well. Um, and there were times where we would stop, take a, take a five minute break, get some a snack, get something to drink, and, and we would talk more then. And then there were some times where I was just encouraging you because you were struggling with the portion of. It. And then there was times kayaking, we had, uh, you know, he really had to help me with that one. Because well, yeah, I had to help him with that one because that was before like the massive surgeries and stuff, and before your retirement at that point. So yeah. it was. Uh, I, he was still hurting freshly from that, and I actually tied him to the back of my kayak and got to pull him, which was really fun. Uh, the main part that I remember that always stuck out to me was when I was very exhausted and he wanted to take a break. When we were uh, kayaking through, there was a small island portion that was really shallow, and it was a really hot day, and I was just like, we need to keep going otherwise I'm not going to be able to do it and you were like Mason just trust me and I got out and I laid on the smooth stones mm -hmm. uh, with the water rushing over me and I think we st stopped there for a good 20 minutes yeah. but when I got back in a second refreshed. wind kick in yeah. and I was very refreshed and I was like it reminded me of like the lesson that you gave to me in that and it's the lesson that I've taken for my life in general is that I'm very much one to not be okay with the gray. I'm either black or white. I like it here or there. I don't like any form of halfway point. like in process. Yeah, That's I, don't, what I, I don't like any <laughs> form of in I process. So the lesson I took from that moment was very much like, don't try to get everything done or everything to where you think it needs to be right in the moment. There are certain times that you need to take a break or rest. just rest. continue on in the process. and Rest in him. You know, when you're, there's things you're really frustrated and building up, you just need to stop everything and relax and re take some time in prayer and just rest and around a campfire or around, you know. What was it like when you had to tagline your dad on your kayak? It was very special for me. It was very, um, it was very important for me because not only did he trust me, but it was also that I felt strong because I was pulling my own father and I was able to have that moment of like leading to give him a break during that period. It's so funny because that's what you remember and I, and I remember you, you know, us talking about that. I remember you being that. very frustrated. I was moment. frustrated. It was really a kick to my pride and I had to just remember that this is life. Sometimes I'm going to need help even if I think I can just grip my teeth and get through it. This is important. I'm not, I may not be able to finish this portion. But you also got the moment like that mm -hmm. for other way around where yeah. you were telling me to take a break on the rocks. Yeah. Yeah. So how did the triathlon end? Uh, when we saw the dog, <laughs> it was so close, but it was so freaking far. We kept going and a half hour, hour into it, you know, that last stretch, because that kayaking portion was how many hours long? The kayaking portion would have been uh, maybe seven or eight seven hours. Seven or eight hours of solid kayaking. On that ending bay, it looked so close, but it fell so far. It felt like we were not moving at all yeah. during that period, and it was hot, and you and I were really sunburnt afterwards. Yes, we were. But I remember we got to the dock. Yeah. We went straight to the edge of the dock. Yes. That's not technically where we're supposed to get out, but it's four or five feet away, so yeah. it was fine, and we got out. After that many hours, I think yeah. we did pretty good. Well, we did great, and it was the uh, best breakfast for dinner oh, that we yeah. had. So that was part of the graduation, too, was after, you know, accomplishing this huge feat that took us, what, 13 hours solid? And we came home. Mama made a huge thing of biscuits and gravy, which was one of our uh, home favorites. Biscuits, gravy, eggs. Oh, uh, that's right. It was a huge bacon. Like, it was, every, they said every breakfast. Everything time. to do with breakfast. <laughs> we just ate and just, I think we 
Did we fall asleep or did we? Uh, we went to bed shortly after. I but we went. We did that on a Friday, and yeah, we so were sore Saturday, for days. Yeah. Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, you and I were like on the couch, yeah. just not going. We were, we were hurting. <laughs> after the graduation, what does discipleship look like now? So many years later, discipleship between us. A lot of times, it's just a simple conversation. It's not like the meet up anymore or like the the formality of it. A lot of times, it's just a conversation of sitting down and questioning usually from me to your me mm-hmm. to mom i'll ask but we also you guys us and the other men get together yeah. and have a bible study that's, that was that's primarily 13 and older that, that was one of the biggest parts that i'm going to very much instill in my own children is that i think it is very important that that when you're growing up from a boy to a man i think it is very important to uh have multiple backgrounds of men mm-hmm uh, instilling or not only not instilling but like supporting you but also showing you different walks of life I got to meet guys uh, and I still know guys who have a drastically different background from my father and other ones who's uh, match up with you more so yeah. so I and from a father's point important. of view it's it's really uh, it's very comforting knowing that when I'm not there and you need guidance or you need prayer, you have other men to go to, to that I trust that, to disciple you and help you. So, I mean, and it's really all of us men discipling to get you know, one another. Okay, Mason, what would be something that you would maybe encourage dads that are thinking about this from a son's perspective? I think it's the most important thing that they can do as a father is investing in discipleship. I genuinely don't think my relationship would be the same way as it is now if he didn't do what he needed to do to do what he was called to do and uh it just made a very big difference in my life i would say that i would say to dads to surround yourself with other men who has the same heart for uh their children and talk about it you know, talk about what this might, you know, what this is and what we could do with this and how could we do it our way because we know our kids, each one of our sons are, you know, a little different. Uh, so we could really personalize this, you know, and, and that you'll get support. You give support, get support and so forth and make those big decisions. And include your, you know, include your wives in it as well. But, you know, ultimately it's men discipling men. Mm-hmm. Of course, we have the women discipling women. Yes, group, absolutely. Your triathlon, Mason, was able to be done quite a few years ago. Uh, how many times have you done this triathlon? Um, I've done it twice now, and I will be doing it a third time here soon. Uh, I think I'll be 24 when my youngest brother uh, turn or becomes of, or comes of age. But um, yeah, it's twice now, and uh, well, what is the Overall, the overall, like, it's about forty miles. Each section's supposed yeah. to be roughly thirteen point something miles mm-hmm. each. Two times under my belt, and uh, a third coming up soon. How's how does that make you feel of him stepping in, and being able to do this for you in that aspect? Um, uh, proud that that my sons see it, how important it is. To help you know with the with the younger ones, kind of like he's taking my place in the lineage. And you still will do the all the I'll, I'll discipleship. Do the part, yes, I'll do all, everything but the yeah, yeah what I can't part. do. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, so, are you looking forward to that next the triathlon? Third one? <laughs> I'll get back to you in three years. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, I want to thank you, Mason, for taking the time to sit down here with your dad out of your busy life. <laughs> thank you for sacrificing that time. So, all right. Thanks, guys. I am Tristan Tallarico. I am their second oldest and most attractive son. <laughs> I'm 18. All right. I so may not have rolled my eyes there. <laughs> All right. So we're talking about the discipleship um, that you went through with your dad. What was that like whenever you went and signed the contract with your dad? You think you were in trouble? I don't know. I thought it was something really cool. Like, because I was like, I don't know what we're doing. I was like, oh, we're walking through the woods. This is cool. Why do you have a weird envelope? I don't know. <laughs> I'm very go with the flow. So I wasn't really overthinking. I was like, ah, oh, what happens, was, happens. I die, I die, whatever. I'm selling you on the black market. Yeah, uh, that's very possible. <laughs> what was your favorite part of that whole time signing? My favorite part was the, the one-on-one. And it was the... 
it felt like one of the first actual like serious things I'd done because you know I was just all I cared about was skateboarding or whether or not it was gonna rain. But that was you know, that was one of the first ones I was actually able to like sit down like it was a serious thing that was gonna impact, and it felt nice to be able to make an actual decision that's gonna affect something. What do you remember most about the spiritual challenges? One of the main things I remember is just us talking about a lot of subjects you don't think you guys would talk about just because the was what the book brought up and hit some uncomfortable topics but stuff that needed to be talked about i remember during the first couple of weeks us were forgetting all the time it hit like two o'clock in the afternoon we're like yeah. oh crap get in here <laughs> and we were like dragging each other off and like hiding away in the bedroom what so, was the uncomfortable subjects well, we don't uh, talk about those for talk youtube censors and censors these are men only subjects <laughs> <laughs> did you like the book that you went over yeah i did I still go through it every once in a while. I mean, not as in-depth as we did together, but every once in a while, I flip through and read a couple spots. I, I encourage each one of them. I mean, anytime they hit a stressful time, if it's something really big, I'll go through that book and remind him, hey, read this section here. That it really helped, you know, Colton, same way. And What are things that you took away from those experiences and those times with your dad that you apply now? Just a lot of knowledge, honestly. A lot of crap I just didn't know. That was it. It was it was just stuff that I learned a lot more and just more of like how to apply it every day. And I still have to go through it again because, you know. I... Your physical challenge, of course, is teaching good and healthy habits. Just had a whole flashback. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> hygiene. Uh, I remember one part very vividly about the hygiene part. And I remember because it was really funny. He walked into the bathroom. I don't even know if you remember this. He I walked into remember. the bathroom, and he's like, all right, first part of hygiene, drop your pants, I'm going to show you how to wipe your butt. And I was like, what? And he's like, no, nah, I'm just kidding. And then, just, and, then, and then he was like, oh, here's some the fingernail clippers, make sure your fingernails are clean and stuff. I remember it, because for he said it with such a straight face. I really panicked and was like, oh, crap, we're doing this. <laughs> but he chuckled, and I was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> Anytime I think of the hygiene, that's my number one thought I think of. The main thing with the with the fitness that I encouraged them was, I'm here, I'm going to help you guys create a workout routine. I don't care if you lift 5 pounds or 50 pounds. As far as that goes, I just want you to create something healthy, a good routine and to keep you active. I did that for a while, and then I bucked and was like, I don't need to work out. And now here I am in police academy. They're like, 170 push-ups <laughs> and 170 sit-ups a day. And I'm like, I mean, it's good. I'm fit. But working out, I do not enjoy it personally. Hey. <laughs> so your triathlon was different than Mason's. Tell me about your experience with the triathlon. <laughs> there were some there were some funny parts, some serious parts, some nice parts. We watched Lord of the Rings my whole life, growing up, always. And it kind of made me think of all the Fellowship of the Ring just traveling across the mountains and the stuff. That's what I, I, never, thought of. I never thought of it. And it was way. just all of us. You have the short <laughs> comedic relief. You have the weird bearded guy that's kind of like our leader. You walk around with a stick a lot of the time. But yeah, that's what I think. It's just like Lord of the Rings, the travel, travel thing. It's one part that super neat just because it was like real, like nobody was out. I, I don't think I'd actually been out and about that early. The first like mile was like this is awesome this is cool this is what we're doing second mile in was like oh my lord we went through this one town we were all walking through we came up out of the woods to the dead center of the street and it looked there was no cars there was like doors swinging with the wind like like screen doors nothing you could hear pin drop you hear birds fly by and i looked around and i looked at mason i was like mason if it would not surprise me if a zombie crawled out that door right now <laughs> i was like would you be ready and he's like heck yeah i'd be ready i'm like oh that'd be so cool then we shifted on to the bike part. That sucked because I cramped a lot. Part way through the cramping, they were like, you know, that's why you have the lemon juice and salt to stop the cramps. And I was like, that doesn't work. It works. And then we get on to the worst part, the kayaking. Think about the coldest part ever. I don't know, it was like your whole body, just like the coldest moment. Times it by two and make it wet. That leads me to my favorite part of the entire trip. <laughs> you ever seen the videos where a cat falls in a bathtub <laughs> and that cat's like, just we freaking love out. You, Tony. <laughs> just freaking out. I did not see him fall in. I only seen the aftermath. And I just see him just, like, he was clawing and his feet were coming up beside him and the, the thing was just spinning. He's like, Nyah! And he, it was the funniest thing. And he gets up, he finally gets back onto it. He has to swim over and drag it to the land. 
dump it over, hop back on. I mean, I have never seen a man that big claw and scrape that fast. It was the funniest thing. We finally, I remember Mason and I, because we were going, we were ahead of everybody. And we were just kind of trucking. Because we were like, oh, it's right after this bridge. We pass under this bridge. We look and we're like, it's not right after this bridge. Four bridges later and like three boats passing by. We're not going to make it there. And then I remember seeing something. I remember it was something where we were like, oh, I know where we're at. Oh, it's the yacht club. Uh, we passed by that and we were like, oh, the yacht. I know where we're at. And we just started booking it. And I didn't realize how cold I was. I mean, I knew I was cold. I didn't realize how cold I was until I stood up. I had blood flow hit my legs. I have never shook so much out of cold, like just the fact of being cold in mine, like I mean ever. To the point where your hands are involuntary shaking like this, mm -hmm. I have never been that cold. But I tell you what, the feast we had when we got back was the single greatest meal I think I have ever had. I think it was three or four plates of sausage, biscuit, and gravy, probably like two or three pancakes. And I know I had to eat probably half a pound of bacon. And the best part is I regretted absolutely none of it. What are some things from the triathlon that apply to life? No matter how sucky you feel or how tired you feel, if you want to get where you got to get, you got to, you got to move no matter how hurt or hungry you are. You got to keep going because if you stop, nothing's going to change. And you're just like, ugh, I don't want to do anything. The only way you can do it is because you just have to keep going. Because you're like, yeah, I don't want to be here. The only way to not be here is to keep going the rest of the freaking 39 miles. Did Pretty it. much like if you want to change where you're at, you have to change where you're at. So, discipleship, is it something that you plan to do with your children? Yeah, I mean, with my line of work, I don't know how, I hope my schedule aligns where I can. But I hope that, you know, old man here. <laughs> can help pick Mason. up in my time. Mason slacks. had that concern. I told him that's what that's what dads are here for. We, you know, if I'm you're too busy, I can step in and help, and you know, vice versa. And if a dad is watching this and he's on the fence about if he should make the time, do it. I would say do it sooner rather than later, because Mason, as Dad said, was um, more of a trial and error to make sure to see if it'd work, and by the time they realized it would. It was a little later for me, and um, I had already went through some things and experienced some things unprepared, and stuff that was a big struggle could have been less of a struggle, and I don't blame it on them. I mean, we, we did it at our pace, but I think if you're thinking about it, do it, because you need to do it now and make sure they are ready and arm them with the right knowledge to attack the stuff they're going to go through as a man. Make better decisions on the plan. Because, yeah, if, you, if they're aware of things that will be an issue before it's an issue, it's good. So do it as soon as you can. Mm -hmm. And even if you're not confident in it, do it because, I mean, you're not going to be confident. You're not going to be great before you do something. you got to do it to be great at it. So you just do it and just use it as a bonding experience between you and your kid to learn what you're doing together. Do you think it helped you and your dad grow closer? Definitely. Now, what is, um, so with starting with Mason and then, uh, and then dad juggling too, and you not getting started until 15, Colton was started at 13, which is the age that we kind of figured through you two yeah. that we should start this earlier. Um, what do you think? Like, what if, uh, what do you think is a good age to start doing, like, the program part of it? The program part of it? I'd almost say make sure to introduce the idea to it at 11 or 12 so they are aware by the time they turn 13 that this is my time to step forward and to really work on this. And not necessarily, like catch him off guard be like oh you're 13 guess what you're doing like they have no idea what if dad is watching this and he and his son and he's like man i missed the mark my son's already 16 well do it now because <laughs> your son could be 27 years old and there's still more stuff he's going to run into and not be aware of how big of an issue it could be there's still stuff you can show them and talking with them will get you closer to them and they will be able to help give you that perspective 
of a younger person. You have that perspective you have, and talking with someone younger and having the good one-on-one -on -one learning, they, you give them a unique perspective of going through this stuff, and they give you the innocence of not being, not have gone through it yet. What was the most difficult thing that you guys had to overcome to be able to be vulnerable and open with each other, especially as men who don't like to open up about their feelings a lot? One of the things I had to start with Mason and each one of the boys, and I had to really drill this into my head that it, it's this important, even with other adult men, is that I cannot... Uh, I can't, we can't trust each other unless we completely open up about everything. So I had to open up my closet and expose all my ugly past uh, and everything to do with my, you know, because <clears throat> how can I hope that you trust me unless I give, you know, unless I uh, give you my dirt, so to speak. So uh, exposing all my skeletons, I think that's a, a key thing there is it, I've got to be vulnerable so they know that I'm, you know, that they can trust me in that sense. Yeah, if you want to get somebody's trust, you gotta give them your trust. You gotta trust yeah. them if you want them to trust you. I think that was the hardest part for me, for each one of the boys, opening up my past and explaining a lot of the dumb, stupid, hurtful things that I've done in my yeah. past, and, and explaining not just what I did, but what how how it affected me, how it affected people around me. Yeah, I will say. Out of all of that, that's not what affected me the most. Well, it is the simplest thing, and ooh, the, the dads watching this may not even think about this. I didn't even think about this until I seen it. Until I seen dad do it. To cry. I didn't think it was allowed to cry as a man. I didn't know I was allowed. I thought it was not okay. It's not something you did. You just hit them and compressed them until they went away. That's how it was kind of so, <laughs> but yeah. To be vulnerable... And allow them to see you that way allows them to realize that it's okay to be feeling this way and not so much mm -hmm. as less than because they're feeling this way. Mm -hmm. So opening up and letting them see the vulnerable side of you lets them see that being vulnerable is okay and not to just wear the hard fake persona that everybody shows. Yeah. There shouldn't be like, I mean, you have the the age you start the actual like contract but as far as like having serious conversations and like the letting them see the emotional side of you do that from as early as they can comprehend it pretty much just to let them know because I know the longer you go without showing that side of you will build up more and more of a wall between you because they think that's not okay so as early as they as early as they can comprehend it probably I would say like probably six seven start being more more like emotional. I know it's hard for a man to be emotional, but try to show them that so they understand that it is okay and like show them that it's okay to have these emotions. We don't lash out, but we still have them. We just learn to control them and let them out when it's when this time. And being emotionally available as a father. Emotionally available and but it is I do believe it is also important to know when to hold those in because there's times where you're gonna feel emotions and you're not it's not mm -hmm. gonna be the time and place to show yeah. them. So you you will have those times you'll have to learn to control them. But I do believe it is good to show that you have them as early on as you can, and then I mean as much as you show is up to you. But I think you should show some from at, as youngest as you can just to make them aware. How, how, I have a question, uh, and I, I should have asked the other boys. <laughs> well, I'm just looking at this, so. Right now, I have a question. I have a question, um, and I, I, want, I should have asked your brothers. Um, how did the discipleship with you and I help prepare you for gathering as uh, with the other guys, the, the men, discipling each other there? It was almost like... A really, 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 really long pregame. Like, okay, gotcha. Like at, going out here and talking with the men is like, that's that's the goal. That's the, we're gonna go out here, group up, and talk about everything. And the discipleship throughout those years was the prep for it, making making sure I'm emotionally there, spiritually there, and physically there, and making sure I'm in the right set and I have my heart's in the right place to go and actually listen, and then. Out of all those years of prep, we went and started it, and it was good. 
And now I feel like, now that I'm older, I feel like all the men's stuff is just the pre-game and prep to go out and about. To go out and make disciples. Make disciples. I guess I said out and about. <laughs> Walk about. Whether you like it or not, you, you make disciples whether you disciple them or not. The question is how you're discipling them. Or I mean, in general, the way, people, the way people look at you, whether you're in a position of influence or not, the way people look at you, you that's, you're discipling them whether you're putting the time in or not because they're watching you. Everybody is. Everyone does. To the point where, you know, I have people that I've never talked to walk up to me and ask me questions. I'm like, how did you know that? And they're like, oh, I've just been, I've been watching you. You should go by and see how you carry yourself. So whether you know or not, you have disciples. So make sure your decisions are careful, carefully made. I would also encourage the, the, the fathers, the men out there to um, talk with your wife because you had just as much input in this as it, yeah. it wasn't just me. You and I had a lot of heart-to-heart sat down and talk and, <clears throat> you know, we threw around ideas and was really prayerful about what God wanted us to do with that. But that discipleship between you and I, it always starts at mm-hmm. home between husband and wife. Then it branches of the children. And we always say all ministries throughout the church start at home and yeah. branch out from the home. You can't mm-hmm. negate your family just to go minister to others and try to disciple others when you're leaving your kids hanging out to dry. Your ministry is your family. Yes, that's right. Let's say I get designated feeder. I'm not going to come here and like not feed my dogs to go feed other ones. Yeah. I'm going to make sure my dogs are fed so they can help pull the sled to feed others. Well, thanks for meeting us in these late midnight hours around your crazy schedule. Oh, yeah. My, let's just say my... Well, thanks for joining us during these midnight hours and your crazy schedule. Morning. It's actually 15 till 1. <laughs> well, good morning. Morning. Um, but seriously, thanks for doing this with us yeah. and sharing your guys' hearts yeah. so that others can, uh, I don't know, maybe be Benefit inspired to figure out a way for their own. Mm-hmm. So, all right. Way bye. Glad you get that. I'm... Colson Tallarico, and I am the next to youngest okay. out of the Tallarico Incorporated. <laughs> all right. A lot of people don't. A lot of people don't know. Um, you guys jokingly said Incorporated just because of all the foster and and different yeah. different children that we've had in the house. What was your favorite part of the whole process of discipleship with your dad? Honestly, there was a lot of just quality time there, understanding. Just listen, I get to hear, uh, hear each of y'all's favorite and each okay, favorite. Yeah. And... I also liked through like the Checkpoints book, I liked hearing all of like the equations from military to uh, discipleship. Mm-hmm. That they were using things like force multipliers, checkpoints, mm-hmm. all that sort of stuff. What's the biggest thing you'll take with you like throughout your life? There's a lot of things I'm taking. There's not a biggest thing. I I think they're all pretty even that I'm taking with me. Is this something that you think that you will do with your children? I'm definitely <laughs> I'm definitely gonna try. It's it's a great way. When you guys signed your contract, of course I was thinking of the future and stuff like that. But I was more so thinking of just in the moment. We were out in nature. It was fall. We had like just eaten. It was really nice. It was a good fire. And then some of the descriptions you read to me about other man tests. Uh, oh my! Other cultures around the world. Uh, I I did a lot of research online just out of curiosity of how other cultures tested their boys to become men and celebrated it and this and that. I saved them all and printed them <laughs> off, and then I read that to them. After after they had signed their contract, you know, just something to for them for us to go. Oh, that's gross! Or ooh, that that the I can't bullet believe. ant one. Yeah, the, the bullet, bullet ant ants on the to where they had glove. to like put all completely yeah. covered, and it would bite all over your hands. You couldn't it, make. It's it kind of a way of saying, "Aren't you glad we're in our culture?" And not yes, that culture? yes, it is. <laughs> your spiritual training, your physical training, and your intellectual training. So, what was your favorite or least favorite out of those three categories? I, I would probably say physical because being able to go out there and physically train my body 
to not only be able to do what I need, but also to help others and like just grow into the man of God you guys are training me to be. It, it's it's just really nice. Now your triathlon was a little different than Mason's. <laughs> there was a lot of people. Yeah, um, I think that was after after people started hearing the people closest to us started hearing about what me and Mason did. The other father started asking a lot of questions. You um actually had your older brother mason who had already been through it came back with friends of your dad's to go through it with you and tristan going through it at the same time so what was it like having two of your brothers with you on this trip it, it was really enjoyable we got to talk about things we enjoyed we got to hang out and of course just before we got to the biking portion we came across that one town and it was like nine in the morning even though for all of us it felt like it was nearing up upon noon and it was just so peaceful and quiet and then we got to like some of the different sections of it that very open field with just flowers all around the field it was very very beautiful what, what I also enjoyed about just being there with that many people is the fact that, of course, one-on-one -on -one is amazing, but just having all the guys there and having that whole brotherhood, brotherhood the camaraderie, camaraderie yeah, yeah, all of that in the moment through some of the harder physical challenges that we've all ever done, really, because that was really difficult on all of us. Was you nervous when uh, Mason would tell you guys stories and be like, you're gonna hurt so bad and <laughs> <laughs> I, I was at first but then once once we got right there four in the morning when i first woke up in my room i came out here and there was like so many people in the house because we we had to leave really soon and then once we were out there i was really excited but it was really really peaceful and quiet and like the smooth calm air what is a lesson that you will take from that experience that you think applies to life? Well, no matter how hard any struggles or trials get, there's going to be a light at the end of the tunnel. There's going to be an easier part to it. The other one is that for for us, we'll, we'll always have a brotherhood there to pick us up when we fall. And of course, it's it's up to us if we allow them to help us or not. But either way, all of our brotherhood is going to be there for us when we need them the most. Which is why it's really good not to just depend on one specific person, but having a select few. Even if you don't want to go as in-depth and have to do it with each of them, you can still like give some to one, some to another, and just allow each of them to help you with an individual part of your struggle. And as you grow, um, you being there for them as they need you. Yeah. As the youngest one who's gone through this, do you think that this has helped the importance of your voice, or is this something that stifles down your voice? No, it really helps put into perspective of what he's been trying to do with us, which is not trying to keep us below him as a son but trying to raise him up with him it's it's been a really good experience if there's some dads watching this and they're on the fence wondering if they're going to do it or not going to do it from a son's perspective what would you say to them if you truly love your son then you're going to actively choose to spend that time with him to help him grow to become either next to you or help him not make the mistakes you did growing up and help him surpass you. Real quick, Colton, what would you say to any boys that if their dad is getting ready to kind of do this with them, what would you tell them if maybe they're nervous, maybe they're hesitant, maybe they don't have that great of a relationship with their dad yet? What's something that you could like a quick encouragement maybe? Give grace. They're human and they're trying their best for you to make a relationship and to help you grow to become a man. What kind of relationship do you have with your dad? It's probably like one of the best relationships. A, uh, I'm going to cry. I try not to look at you so I don't. It's probably one of the best relationships a, a boy in this world and in this modern day society can get. 
because just seeing all these boys out there, what they're all doing, and how honestly, how horrible a lot of that stuff is, to know that I am blessed enough, oh gosh, I'm gonna cry. the fact that I am blessed enough to have a, both father and mother, who love each other, respect each other, and are truthful enough to both each other and us as their children to also be good enough to God and to attempt their best to listen to him and raise us in the best of their ability. So, yeah. Well, we're not asking you any more questions because you have us all crying. <laughs> yeah. all right, that concludes your interview. Thank I'm you for sharing. Out. Thank you for sharing your heart with us. We love you. Yeah. Hey guys, Carrie Tallarico, finally in front of the camera instead of behind like most of this video. Most of this video has been focused on dads discipling their sons. And that's because that's something that's very important to us. Not only discipleship in general, but really the men of God in their life, in young men's lives, calling out the men of God there to be. But on the other side, um, we didn't just disciple our sons. We discipled our daughters as well. And our God given to us daughters, those girls that we influence and that are in our lives and in our circles. So I just really wanted to quickly give you some resources that I use. Now we didn't do any crazy big triathlon, but we did have some really great resources and we had some great books that we went through and great study guides that really help form their identity in Christ. Below, I'm going to post a link for all these books and all these resources. This is really a great resource. I loved it because it wasn't like one side or the other. Like sometimes it can be women shouldn't work and sometimes women should work and, you know, and no patriarchy and no matriarchy. And it could just become a very hot, futile mess. This book is very well balanced because really it talks about a heart issue and it talks about your identity. It doesn't matter if you want a job, if you want to go work and you want to be single for the rest of your life and you don't feel called to be married. That's not the point of it. It's about learning your heart and why you choose certain ways. It's got a good filter system through it to help you be able to figure those things out and a lot of great resources. So I highly recommend this book. It's a really great one um, to just learn about Girl Defined. Its own description is God's radical design for beauty, femininity, and identity. And that is so important to know whose you are, who you are, and the motives behind why we do the things that we do. Another book that we went over was The Resolution for Women. And that one is based off of the Courageous movie. They had made Courageous, which was really toward fatherhood. And they produced The Resolution for Men. And then they also saw the importance in the avenue of making sure they answered to the women also. But that book covers so many things. And that was kind of our next stage of book that we went through. Um, another one that I went through with just a couple of our girls. I had no daughters by birth, but I have daughters. Some of our girls had some different particular issues and one of the books that I also did was a dad shaped hole in my heart. <laughs> um, that one has a lot of mean in it. It definitely should be for more mature and ready to hit like some serious issues if they've got some dad issues. It can be a little hard to get through so it's one that you definitely want to slow down, take your time, and really process it as you're going through it. But boy, it has some beautiful points in it. And honestly, even if you don't have dad issues, maybe your dad was a great Christian example. There's some good meat in it too for that. And just how to really see our fathers as their fathers and not some fake ideal that we get in our head from society or movies or even our own, our own opinion of what a dad should be. So anyhow, um, between these, a lot of crazy emotional phone calls, a lot of prayers, a lot of just living life together and being an ear and being a voice of reason and a sound counsel and of repeating scripture of who God says they are 
and having them write it on a mirror or something crazy like that so they can see it every single day. That is a lot of what we went through with our girls. We made sure and I made sure to go through each of the books definitely for every single one of them was the two the girl to find and the uh, resolution for women i just want to kind of give you some tools for if um, you're watching this and maybe you have a daughter that you need to help speak that identity into thanks god bless if you like this video make sure and hit that thumbs up and if you think of somebody that this video could bless share it to them Discipleship's important. Investing in people is important. It's what God intended for all of us to do. No one's off the hook. We all need to be doing it. And whether you have children or not, you have people in your life that you need to be investing in. And that is something that God awoke in our hearts. And we just really hope that this blesses you. Thanks, guys. Who are you? That's too deep of a question. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Um. <laughs> Alright. You want us to do it again? Yes. Starting. Alright. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Jake. <laughs> so you can't smile in the back. Start that again. Like, give it proper. There are two more. My name's James. Yeah, you were so <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> Tristan, can you tell me what time it is? Uh, it is, uh, it's, it's very early. You monitor yeah. college? No. Oh, shut up. <laughs> What's the word? Mom. Monetization? Something like that? <laughs> I can't with you right now. It's too late. <laughs> I thought you were getting ready to ask me my age up. <laughs> oh! Dang old! It's gonna be consistent cuts of him Hunter being dry eyed and red faced and teary eyed. And then back to dry eyed again. <laughs> He's gonna be my. My past oldest son. <laughs> I, I can't look at him. <laughs> when he was snoring at first, and when mom put mom did this, he was on one, and then she went like this, and when she went like that, he went <laughs> like his tongue shook for a whole moment. Like, <laughs> Italian. <laughs> 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 Mamma mia! <laughs>